Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. This is our every other week live Q&A. I hope everyone is doing well. I see folks are already asking questions. So that's good. Um, if I can just get a thumbs up that you can hear me. Now that I do this every other week, it's like I keep wondering, you know, did I trip over a wire or something in the last two weeks and completely mess things up? And maybe I'm just talking into a camera and absolutely no one is part of the show. Oh, I got a thumbs up from James. Thank you. I asked you, a, I, I started off with a with a poll because I was curious, kind of curious how many of you that watch, you know, sort of knew me from Dough Roller Money podcast days, which seems like forever ago. I'll talk briefly about that. Um, but so I wanted to talk, it's my little my little monologue to start us off, and then I'll get to the important stuff, which is your questions. And, well, and the other important thing, some shows I'm watching that are really good. We've got to talk about that. Um, it's come up in a couple of different contexts. I actually had the, fa the, the founder of Maxify reach out to me. He's a professor at Boston University. Now, I graduated from law school from Boston University. I love BU. So he's a professor there. So you know he's a smart guy. And I'm, the long and short of that back and forth is that I'm going to be on his podcast. And I got to be honest, I'm a little intimidated because Maxify, and I did a review of it, and that's sort of what prompted the discussion. Um, he, uh, it, it, he takes, you know, I, I, well, this is my take on it. He may describe it in a very different way, but he takes economic theory and sort of a, applies it into the, the context of retirement planning, at least, you know, to some degree, and that's Maxify. And, um, you know, I'm obviously not an economist. I majored in English. What do I know? I, I did take micro and macro economics though. And I got A's in both classes, but I'm guessing probably can't hold a candle to what he knows about economics. Uh, but it, it, I, th I think it'll be an interesting discussion. And one of the things that's come out of it, um, as I've just thought about different issues from retirement planning is, as we all know, there are a host of uncertainties, when, well, in life generally, but also in the context of retirement. We obviously don't know when we're going to die or, you know, our spouse, or even if our uh, you know, marital relationship, you know, you could be single and you could get married in retirement. You could be married and get divorced. A spouse could die early. We don't know future stock bond returns. We don't know inflation. Um, you know, we don't know health issues and other sort of, I'll call it unexpected expenditures. There's the tax code. Who knows what's going to happen there? And almost everything we talk about in the context of retirement whether it's what should your stock bond allocation be in re retirement? How much cash? That's a popular question. I get tons of email. How much cash should I have? Um, should you follow the 4% rule uh, or some other withdrawal strategy? Should you, should you buy an annuity to some extent? When should you claim social security? Uh, should you buy long-term care? I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And all of these questions the, the, the thing they have in common is we're trying to address one or more of these uncertainties in one way or another. And I've come to a few overarching conclusions about that. One is there are multiple ways to deal with each, each of these uncertainties, all of which in the right context could be very, very reasonable. You know, buying a single premium immediate annuity can be a reasonable solution to the problem of longevity, uh, I, not that that's a problem, but you know, longevity risk, uh, maybe even to a fear of investing and wanting just some certainty in your life, right? It could be a reasonable uh, approach, uh, but, but also not buying annuity could be a very reasonable approach as well. Uh, I'm gonna do a video on this, but it's come up in the context of claiming social security. You know, there's no one right way to claim social security, uh, and, and what I have found, there are tools that I'm going to cover in the video. I, I plan to, I think, publish it this week. I have to look at my calendar. But in any event, they take basically one of two strategies. One strategy is uh, let's use Social Security as longevity insurance. So let's, you know, we're, we're very unlikely to live to be 100, but we might. And so if we sort of delay Social Security or do or run the calculations, because it, it, it can get very com complex, particularly if you're married, um, uh, but run the calculations, say, assuming you're going to live to be 100, even though that's highly unlikely. 
but let's just assume it. Um, it'll likely push out when you're gonna when you should claim Social Security, but then you'll get a, a higher amount, and it, you know, and it'll last. If assuming you lived a hundred or even older, you know, you know, I mean, Charlie Munger, I mean, he's just making a killing on Social Security, right? Um, but that's one approach. But it, it's not the only, in my opinion, not the only reasonable approach. The, and, and by the way. Uh, Maxify, I think, takes that approach. You can obviously set the assumptions wherever you want, but I think their standard sort of out-of-the-box assumption is you live to be 100. So that's sort of the Maxify approach. New Retirement has its own Social Security Explorer tool, and it's basically based on the same thing. Um, and, but then you have Mike Piper's Open Social Security, and he takes an actuarial view. He sort of says, okay, what's the percentage that chance that you'll live to be 70, 71, 72? I think he goes all the way up to 115 and then just calculates the best approach based on that actuarial sort of likelihood to die at a given age uh, approach. I think that's a reasonable approach too. The point and sort of the point of this short monologue, it's probably already too long, right? Is that um, uh, I think each of these strategies, and we're just focused on social security. We, again, we could apply this to buying annuities or not, stock bond allocation. I mean, the list goes on and on. There are pros and cons to both. Not only that, but when you when you make a decision in one area, let's say using social security as longevity insurance, that may affect what you might want to do in another area. Like for example, you might say, well, in my situation, I'm going to assume I'll live to be 100 and calculate social security that way for sort of longevity insurance, but that means I'm comfortable not buying an annuity. Or maybe you do both, but the point is there are pros and cons to each of to each of these and um, and what you do in one can affect a, another. And as you're thinking through these issues, I, I really sort of a red flag goes up for me um, whenever I'm talking to someone and and they're almost too adamant about their approach. And, and, and not just the, I don't mean that the, the, that they're adamant about the approach they're personally going to take. Because hopefully you're somewhat adamant, I mean, you know, but with an open mind about what you're personally going to do, but what others should do. And I think that's why if you've watched this show long enough, you know that I, I don't normally pound the table and say, by golly, I've got my eight baby steps and you better follow them because that's the only way to go. All right. That was a shot at Dave Ramsey. I'm sorry. He did nothing wrong here. I don't know why I took a shot at him. I did. Um, like he knows who I am. I think he's doing okay. Anyway, I, I think that's why I tend to you know, I have my own opinions and my own strategy for my own retirement, but I, I think it's, I, I try, maybe I should do better, but I try to just say, well, you know, there's pros and cons to that option. And let's look at those pros and cons. Like the, the downside, by the way, what's the downside of using social security as longevity insurance and just assuming, putting in a calculator, you're going to live, live to be hundred or 105 what, what, or whatever. What's the downside? Well, you're likely not going to be making the optimal claim because why? Because you're not likely to live to be 100 or 105. Okay, well that's a downside. You can almost think of that as if you decide to use it as longevity insurance, that downside is kind of like your insurance premium. You could actually calculate it. You could compare one tool that uses, say, uh, you, you assume you're going to live to be 100, and and then an actuarial approach, and you could see the, the deltas, and maybe could view that as, as as your insurance premium in a way, but. But I guess the big takeaway is almost all of the decisions we make when it comes to retirement in some way deal with an uncertainty. We need to realize that there are pros and cons to any appro reasonable approach uh, and that the approach you take in one area could affect what you do somewhere else. I another quick example, and then I'll stop talking, or at least about this, um, is a lot of people will say, um, I'm living off my social security and pension and I'm, co we're comfortable. We're good. I've got this money over here. I'm not going to spend it. Maybe I'll give it to my kids, maybe to charity. Should, should, should this fact affect how I invest? Well, yeah, it might reasonably affect how you invest. Maybe your 90, 10 portfolio, even at 70 or 80, because you don't plan to spend it, right? You've got your longevity risk and, you know, just having enough money to spend in retirement, you got that covered. Social security, pension, very secure. So yeah, might affect how you uh, invest your money. Makes perfect sense to me. All right, enough of that. I know you're all grateful. Rob's done. So 8% of you out of 159 votes sort of found me from the Dole Roller Money podcast. 87% from this YouTube channel 
And I just put in other, that's 5% of you. I don't know what that could be. That's okay. Interesting. Okay. I kind of, I have expected there to be more from the Dough Roller Money podcast. Now I haven't owned that since 2018 and I haven't been a part of it for now a year or two. Uh, and I don't think they're doing it anymore. Uh, I don't think they're they're releasing new episodes. So maybe eight or nine percent. Maybe that makes sense. All right. By the way, I saw Noreen is here. Thank you for being here, Noreen. You're I don't know what we do without you. And I I also saw I don't know what they were, but you deleted a bunch of comments. So I'm sure they were um, nasty. <laughs> That's one way to put it. So let me get to the questions. Um, let me see if I can maybe put them up here. I don't know. There's a couple that I can't put up there. One is from Micah asking me, I'll be able to show them on the screen in a minute, but I can't yet, I don't think. Anyway, she asked me about Schwab's Intelligent Income, which is a, a tool I think I've heard of it. I've never used it. I've never looked into it, but I will. Uh, others have brought it up and I, I'm interested in it. So, um, but, but Micah, I have not looked at it yet. Um, in fact, let me just pull it up. Schwab Intelligent Income. I'll check it out. Here's what it looks like. Um, see how long your savings could last. All right. So I'll look into it, but no, I've not, I've not, um, I've not used it or, or, or evaluated it. Smitty's Place says, and I'm not quite, for some reason, I've got to get into a few of the comments before I catch up with what I can show you on the screen. Anyway, um, oh, I didn't tell you about the TV shows I've been watching. I'll get to those maybe a little bit later. Really good. Smitty's Place, with the thought of the interest rates going down sometime in the future, what are your thoughts on buying a five-year CD? And he says through Vanguard. Um, it's a good question. So your five-year CD, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to go to my website, allcards.com, just because we'll see more of them. I don't know if we have vanguards up there or not. If we don't, I'll add them. Um, I'm working on some, I think, cool things with this site. Like, you'll be able to look at CDs by bank if you want, but it'll also show you the rank of each CD as compared to our entire database, you know, based on the APY. Um, that'll be up soon. I've got some other things I'm working on. I'm just a slow coder. So, um, so the, the, he said, I think 5%, but I'm seeing fours here. I don't think we have Vanguard in here. You might need to add Vanguard. But um, the deal is this, you know, you can get better rates than this right now for shorter term. I mean, you get a savings account that pays over 5% right now. But of course, a savings account rate uh, ch can change daily. So uh, should you lock in? I guess the real question is, should you lock in for five years? My instinct tells me that would be a reasonable bet. But as you probably know, I don't invest based on my views of future interest rates. So I don't personally own long-term CDs. Uh, but I, I, if, 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 I don't think it's an unreasonable approach. Of course, it depends on what you want the money for, what you're doing with it. Um, obviously, there's risk, right? The risk is interest rates go up um, and you're in a nominal effectively a nominal bond, but I mean, a CD, um, and to get out of it, you know, you, you, you'd have to pay a penalty. Um, so, there, you know, it's not without risk, but I kind of think we're getting close to the Fed stopping to raise raise rates. The question is, do, do they really have an inflation under control or not? Your, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I know it's trended down here lately, but, um, you know, I know the market thinks they're going to cut rates, not soon, but I don't know what the date is a year or two from now. So I could see a five-year CD at today's rates turning out to be a pretty good deal. But again, your guess is as good as mine. All right. Hmm. Rodney talks about it. He has a Pac-Man game. That's, I, I think, in reference to my image on my YouTube channel, which is Miss Pac-Man. And that was my game back in the day. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Tyler says, I'm trying to save for the me a medium-term goal. I could buy a car or second or second house 
in three to 10 years, but I have flexibility if the market is not on my side. Is a 60-40 portfolio wise? Well, first of all, there's a big difference between three and 10 years when it comes to investing. Um, that's number one. Uh, like, if, you know, but, but you say you have flexibility, uh, which to me means if the market didn't do well, you could hold off, right? Um, a 60-40 portfolio, I'm trying to think of a resource. Well, you know, we can go to Portfolio Visualizer, um, which of course is just, you know, going to give us history, but that's okay. Let's do that real quick. So we'll do yes, stock market at 60, and I'll just use total bond. I'll show you what I'm looking at. Um, where's uh, Where are my bonds? Fixed income. We'll do... Uh, total U.S. bond market is 40. And then we'll run this number. And then uh, obviously we can look, this, so this goes back to 87. We can go year to year, right? So first thing I note is what's been sort of the worst run? I guess, well, of course, we all know last year by itself was, was pretty rough. But, you know, you've got three down years here, but it, it recovered quickly. Of course, again, we don't know that history is going to repeat itself. But if you look at this, um, over three years, you know, you could be in trouble. Over 10 years, you're probably going to be okay. You know, the, the problem is, you know, you don't you don't make this decision once. I mean, you could. You could say, okay, I'm going to put it in 60-40. Uh, let's just assume it's 10 years. And I'm going to put my head down, and 10 years from now, I'm going to take the money out. Uh, but, of course, you're going to be watching the market along the way. And your your ten year investing horizon, a year from now is nine years, <laughs> right? Ten minus one is nine. Yeah, two years from now it's eight. You see where this is going? Eventually it's three years away. Now what do you do? You pull it out. I suppose if you've met your goal and you have the money that you need to buy whatever it is you want to buy, maybe you do, right? Bird in the hand kind of thing. But I, I go back to this um, chart and I think you know these are good years. But what if you're what if eight, nine, and ten are these years? Of course, you could still say, well, over the 10-year period, you're up. Yeah, these were some big years in the in the late 90s. Um, so, but but I, I guess I just point out that this is not a, a question you're going to ask yourself once over whatever uh, 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 investing horizon, you know, you're going to pick. And it's different, you know, it's different, very different than retirement, right? Because you could say, well, Rob, we're taking money out every year in retirement too. Yes, but you're not taking it all out. If I understand the question, going to buy a car, a house, whatever. You know, it's kind of almost like college, you know, where you're saving, you don't take it out all at once, but you take it out over four years here, you take it all out at once. And so what's going on in the market at that time is really important. You know, the other thing you can look at is, um, you know, you've got like five and 10 year, but then you can go, let's see if I can find it, um, rolling returns. And you can look at the, like the 10 year averages eight and a half. What's the worst? So the worst case 10 year rolling return. And that means uh, I, from 87, they're looking at 87 plus 10, 88 plus 10, 89 plus 10, right, is 127. So you're not, at least his, historically, you're not losing money. Um, obviously, you're not making a lot of money there, but um, average much higher. Over three years, as you can see, yeah, definitely, definitely can lose some money. And we saw that um, uh, in the 2000 to 2002 time frame. So... I mean, that's about all I got to say about it. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you got you to do what you're comfortable with. Um, Rodney, now is this question, can I put this up on the screen yet? I still can't get to the screen yet. This is a good question. Uh, Rodney said, asked, question, does the 4% rule apply in Canada? Is it a good starting point for planning retirement income? Um, that's a great question. Uh, the, the short answer, so first of all, let's say you're living in Canada. It would absolutely apply. Um, it, it would apply anywhere in the world, assuming you're investing in U.S. assets, because the 4% rule, at least as tested by Bill Bingen and others, is based on the U.S. stock and bond markets. And but I, I, should, I should say, I should back up, though. It, it actually wouldn't apply everywhere because... You could even if assuming you could invest in the U.S. markets, in some places that's not so easy. It also assumes U.S. inflation rates, and that you can't mimic. I don't know if there's some sort of option strategy that would allow you to, in whatever country you're in, 
mimic our inflation, but then you also have exchange rate issues. So it gets much more complicated now that I think about it. But having said that, Canada did pretty good. So let me see if I can put my hands on this fairly quickly. Wade Fowl did it. Wade Fowl, it's all his fault. Uh, 4% rule, um, international. And he actually looked at a number of countries. Uh, here it is. I think this is it. Yeah. Okay. So here's his article. It's, it's an older article, as I recall. Yeah, this only goes through 1986, so it's dated. But look at who's number one, Canada. Look at that. Our friends from the north. Um, now, his numbers were a little different than Bengen's, but not by much. So I don't know how well you can read that, but the U.S. is 3.94. But Canada won it, 3.96. Um, now, that may, again, that may... That probably would change for sure now that I think about it, because in the years following 1986, um, particularly you know into the 90s, I mean, the U.S. has crushed it. Um, but Canada has done very well. Um, again, I don't have updated numbers. Um, and, and this doesn't tell us what the future is going to be like. I think the 4% rule is a reasonable approach from a planning perspective. I think in... In actually living in retirement, I probably wouldn't follow it, at least not religiously. For starters, it's unlikely that I'm going to spend the exact same amount of money each and every year in retirement on an after-inflation basis. Um, and my my preference would be to have a plan where I could actually live comfortably on less than 4%. And that's just to be conservative. Um, the thing about Canada is, in the United States over these time periods, is that we, we, we might, by and large, haven't you know fought a war on, on our home turf haven't lost a war, you know, on our home turf, uh, knock on wood. And um, neither country, I don't know about Canada, but I'll make this assumption, has experienced hyperinflation of any kind. And you don't need to experience hyperinflation for long for it to mess up the 30-year 4% rule calculation. And a perfect example of that would be Germany post-World War One. So, in fact, it's on here. If you look at Germany... Uh, it's, it's safe withdrawal rate 1.01, and the worst year was 1914, was actually you know World War One. but their hyperinflation, I think, occurred after World War One. although I'm sure 1914 was no picnic either. Um, so there you go. Well, I guess I hope that's helpful. I'm glad I found that article. All right. I'm going to move over to, to uh, things I can show you. So I will go to this question that's asking about JEPQ. It was also JEPI, J-E-P-I. Let me, uh, I went to Morningstar and I got a 404. Let's see if I can pull, oh, there it is. So um, here it is. And so the way you search for any ETF or mutual fund or, or stock, you just type in the ticker, um, Q. Here it is, equity premium. So um, the thing about this kind of fund is that, at least from what I've seen on Morningstar, it doesn't really tell you what you need to know. You can go to the portfolio, and it looks like a large cap growth, mostly U.S. equity. But then you get this pesky 16, I don't know how well you can see it, 16.69% that's not classified. What's going on with that? And so the best way to figure that out is just to go to the web the website of the fund. Um, it's a J.P. Morgan fund. Here it is, J.P. Morgan Nasdaq Equity Premium Income, and let's see here. I wanted to. Where can I find it? It's done well this year. 86 holdings. Here we go. This is what I wanted. I could have shown you this on Morningstar too. Its dividend yield is 12.07. Uh, you probably can't see it that well, but just trust me. Maybe maybe you can see. 12.07. Hello. Now, I hate the fact that it's called a dividend yield because most of that is not dividend, right? Um, you know, this most of that 12.07, I don't think. Let's go back. Um, here we go. Yeah. 
generates generates income through a combination of selling options, which you would get a premium when you sell the option, and that's a big part of that yield is is, is premium, and investing in U U.S. large cap growth stocks, which we know the dividend yield on U.S. large cap growth stocks is not much at all. Probably depends exactly how they do it, but probably under one percent. Um, and so if you go to like a and and if you go to like a Reddit. And I follow Jeppy on Reddit and, and the people there, they just are going, they're, they, they're fun to watch. I mean, they, they talk about being excited about investing. They just love these funds and the income. The problem is, is that there certainly will be times when these funds do well, often, by the way, when the market's not doing well, because the, 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 the call options, I think they're all call options. I could be wrong about that. I think they're call options. Uh, don't get called away and they just pocket the premium. Um, but of course, the market may be going down, but because of the premiums, they're not going to do as bad as um, just a straight up index fund covering the same market. Now with Jeppy and do they call it JEPQ, JEPKI? I don't know. J-E-P-Q. They're very young funds. Uh, they've only been around a couple of years, I think. And um, I don't think they're just tracking. They're, they're they're using the NASDAQ 100, but I think they're, they're not tracking everything. As you saw, there's 86 um, positions, I think. Um, and so I guess time will tell how it, how it will do. I certainly wouldn't own this in a taxable account. I think you'd get crushed uh, unless I'm missing something, which is always possible. Um, but I, I generally think that people get excited about this because of the dividend yield or the yield I really should call it. And, but I think long term, I, I have I have my doubts that it will do as well as just a straight up index fund portfolio. But, it, you know, it hasn't been around that long. So uh, I guess time will tell. So that's my take on it. I've talked about it in the past. Okay. You know, all the questions I was asking you, I now see that I could have shown them on the screen. I am such a rookie. Okay. Oh, well. So John wants to know what the, what would the short and long term effects be if the U.S. defaulted on its debt? Well, I really don't think it's going to default on its debt, even if it defaults on other obligations. At least that's the plan, or that was the plan in 2011, where they had ways to continue to pay the debt, even as they didn't pay other obligations. Politically, that's tricky because it's like. You get people saying, and I get this, they say, wait a minute, you're telling me you're going to pay on the debt, including payments to, let's say, China, but you're going to shortchange retirees wanting Social Security? Yeah, that's a hot potato politically. I'm not sure how well that would go over. So um, I, I think, I, I, I really don't think they'll default. They're going to figure something out. That I, I just believe they will. The short-term effects, though, if they did default, um, well, it would send the markets into a complete tailspin. Of course, I'm just guessing. I would think the stock market would get pummeled 20, 30 percent. I don't know. It would be bad. Markets around the world would get pummeled. A lot of things depend on the treasury market, not just the treasuries themselves. I mean, they're used as collateral uh, in, 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 in different short term borrowing. I mean, you know, so that would all be uh, a disaster. Uh, payments would get delayed uh, or uh, wouldn't be made in full, whether you're talking about payments to the states for like Medicaid, payments to health providers for Medicare, social security checks, payments you know to government employees or contractors. I think long term, you know, I, there was an effect at least in theory the last time, right? We had we got downgraded. I don't know how much it really affected things, but if we do things that cause the world's financial markets to lose confidence in our in the dollar and in treasuries, I think there could be long-term effects. It's just that it's unclear to me what exactly those would be and when. I mean, you could say, well, you know, the dollar is sort of the reserve currency. You know, it's what it's the go-to currency in the world. That could change, and. Um, but 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 the question, at least in the short to medium term, is well, what would take its place? And there's no good answer to that right now. Um, but I could see the world trying to come up with an answer, 
if we can't get our act together, what that would look like and when, I don't know. But those were all just guesses, you know. I, I know one other effect would be there. I'd have a ton of people on the show, live, the live show. Whenever like a bad thing is going on, more people watch the live Q&A. Anyway. Scott, he says it's his first time being on a live session. Welcome. Glad to have you. All right. If you can tag me at Rob Berger, it shows up orange, and I'll, I'll find your comments a little faster. But I try to kind of skim through everything. <laughs> Ethan, you know, I should, you know what I should do? I can't do it now. Ethan said, I, I let the ad play just for you, Rob. Don't spend it all in one place. I will turn, if I, as long as I don't forget, I will turn off the ads for the live show. And I can turn them on for the people that watch it after the fact. Because I mean, you're here, you're taking time out of your day to watch this live. You shouldn't see an ad. I'll have to just remember to do that. I can turn them off. Kat says, one year away from retiring. Congratulations. What are your thoughts on how to decide to keep with your set withdrawal strategy or make a change? Well, I guess it would depend on what your current strategy is and why you're considering making a change. If you want to share that, I'm happy to give you my two cents, and it's worth every penny. So Josh wants to know my take on value averaging in. I always thought it was too complicated, and it's not that complicated, but I just never did it. And let me just see um, if I can find you a resource. So the idea is, as I understand it, is rather than just contributing a set amount every month, it's based on valuations. So for example, if the if, if the portfolio or the investment went down, you'd buy more. If it went up, you'd buy less. Investopedia has an article on it, which you can read. I'm sure if you back tested it, it probably could work out just fine. I, I just felt like it was just more complication than I wanted in my life. So I never followed it. I mean, I can't say that it's a bad idea, but it is more involved than just, you know, here, Vanguard, here's my money for the month. <laughs> Raj wants to know my thoughts on VTINX versus VASIX. I've gotten so used to dealing with ETFs. Are these... Okay, this is oh, this is so VTINX. Here, I'll pull it up. Is it a retirement? Oh, a retirement income fund. Um, I'm not a huge fan of target date funds as you get near retirement. But but depending on your circumstances, they could be uh, ideal. But I'll show you why, and I'll look at the other ticker in a second. But this is VTINX. Do I have the right one? VT yeah. Um, You'll notice that the fixed income, 66% cash for, so this is like a 70% fixed income and then roughly 30% U.S. equities. Now, it may be that that's the asset allocation you want. And let's assume this is in a retirement fund, uh, so you don't have to deal at least right away with the taxes on the fixed income. Uh, this, you know, a perfectly good fund. You would have to keep an eye on, I don't know whether this one changes anymore. I'm guessing it doesn't, but you'd want to confirm that. And what I mean by that is, you know, target date funds uh, ch change the asset allocation. N normally, the target date funds are like the 2040 fund or 2050 fund. And as you get closer to that date, they change the asset allocation. They can even continue to change them after you retire, and they have, can have a couple of different target date funds for post-retirement. I'm guessing retirement income fund doesn't, but that's just a guess. But for me, I just would never, for me, I, I would never be in a 70-30 portfolio. But if 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 someone said, yeah, that i that's what I want, I it's eight basis points. It's, uh, I like the fund. Um, again, I've never invested in it. Um, by the way, it's you know, it's one fund, but just to be clear, uh, very diversified. Uh, you know, we can come down here and see. Um it uses other funds, it's a fund of funds, but you know, it's got total. I didn't mean to click on that total bond fund. It's probably probably has 
10,000 bonds or more. Um, you know, international stock. I mean, we've looked at all these. So um, it's a very, you know, it's, it's got thousands of positions. Well, let's just look just as an example. Let's look at total bond market too. I bet it's got more than 10,000 bonds in this thing. Yeah, 15,000 in that one fund. Fifteen. So, you know, it's a very diversified portfolio. It's got international and, and U.S. stocks. So, um, but, but for me, it wouldn't be the right asset allocation, but maybe for you it is. So the other one you asked about, oh, I, I like the life strategy funds. Generally, I like the concept. You, again, you just have to get to the right asset allocation. This is an income fund. So I'm guessing, is it 2080? Yeah. So it's 20% um, stocks, 80% uh, fixed income. So between the two, uh, what it would come down to for me is do I want a 20% stock, 80% bond uh, allocation, or do I want 70 30? Right. And, and I think with life strategy, you can't get 70 30. I think they go in increments of 20, unless they've changed it since I last looked at it. All right. Conscience, hello. Welcome back to the show. Wants to know for a Roth, would I go with FLCOX, which I've never heard of, at least don't remember that ticker, or Schwab's dividend fund? Well, I like the Schwab dividend fund, and I actually owned that, full disclosure. I own shares of SHED, is that what they call it? SCHD, in, in a Roth account, actually. Now, it's a relatively small overall allocation because, and this is sad, we don't own a lot of Roth. I wish we did. Okay. I don't know FL. Let me look this one up. Is this a Fidelity fund? Fidelity large cap value. Okay. So here it is. Very inexpensive. Three and a half basis points. Um, I'm pretty sure we can look at it, but I'm pretty sure the Schwab fund is roughly the same place in the Morningstar style box. Um, let me let me pull it up. We can compare it side by side. They're probably I, I can tell you I'm, my view is going to be they're both reasonable options for a value. I, I view these as value funds, not dividend funds, but those two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, let's see here if I can do this side by side real quick for you. Maybe there we go. So we got Schwab on the right here. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the blue dot, pretty much, I guess Schwab's a bit more value. And you can see that in the numbers. Price to earnings is 1367 versus 1465. Um, price to book is interestingly a little higher. I wonder if they have more financial services. Financial services here is 19%. Yeah. And here, the reason I, I said that is... Sometimes I might not make a whole lot of sense. Um, my wife would probably agree with that. Um, I noticed that although this, this one is a little more tilted towards value, its price to book is actually higher than, than this one. Um, and that made me think, well, you know, a lot of banks' valuations on, on a price to book basis are pretty low, particularly right now. Banks have, you know, had a hard year. So then I thought, well, I wonder if this one just owns more banks. And it does. I don't know if that fully explains the difference in the price to book, but it seems to me like it would be relevant. So it's 19 here, 19% versus 13 and a half. I don't know that I feel strongly about that. Um, I mean, I own Schwab. I, I would probably pick Schwab, which I guess I, I already did, didn't I? But I think these are both reasonable options. All right, let me show you the shows real quick that I've been watching. This is a it's a short break from money. Two of them that I like. So I watch Michael J. Fox's Still, a documentary. And of course, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I mean, you know, I, I uh, you know, in the '80s, I was in high school. He was doing Family Ties, which was set in Columbus. In a, but they called it there was a place called German Village. In Columbus. If you ever go to Columbus, go to German Village. The book loft is a wonderful bookstore. And there's a co nice coffee shop right next door. But they called it like German Town, or they, they didn't call it German Village, which always bothered me. 
And then, of course, Back to the Future in 1985, I think is when it was released. But anyway, the documentary, obviously, about his life and his his you know his experience with Parkinson's, um, very moving documentary. I really enjoyed it. So there's that one. The other thing I started watching is Silo, which is based on a book called or series called Wool. I had read, I think, the first one when it came out years ago and, and enjoyed it. I don't really know why I didn't continue reading the series, but I'm liking that um, so far. Okay, back to money. Hey, by the way, leave in the comments anything you're watching that you like because you guys give me good ideas for other shows to watch. So Mary wants to know if I'm making any changes in regard to my money, given the horrible potential scenario of the U.S. defaulting. The short answer is no. I did a video on it. I, I you know, we, we always keep some no, number of months just in a good old-fashioned FDIC-insured bank account, and that's not going to change. Um, I'm not. I haven't changed my investments at all. Uh, I'm not sure what else I would do. I really don't think we will default. If we did, I think it would be resolved quickly just because, and, and, and by the way, it's not because I have a whole lot of confidence in the politicians in Washington, but rather because the consequences would be so horrible that I just can't imagine that they wouldn't reach a, an agreement. And by the way, we've been through this many, many, many times, and there's all a lot of hand wringing and oh my goodness, and um, you, you know, whoever... Both sides kind of do the same thing, but for different reasons. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes it's the, the Republicans saying we want spending cuts or we're not going to lift this debt ceiling. The Democrats have done the same thing, but it's usually not because of um, they're demanding spending cuts, but it's usually something. In fact, President Biden, when he was a senator, was part of this same sort of thing in the Senate. Um, and I'm, my point, you know, I'm not I don't want to get into like who's to blame or who's more at fault if I don't honestly I don't really see it that way maybe you do and that's fine but you know we've been through this I just think they're going to resolve it maybe I'm just hopeful all right but anyway yeah I'm not I've not changed anything so all right so now we've got a question on small cap exposure from Doug VTMSX or VSMAX I you know, if you want small cap exposure, I generally, I don't, I, we'll look them up. I'm sure I've looked at both of these. Um, I, I know I have. Um, I might own one of them. <laughs> I should probably know what I own. Let me actually look that up real quick. I will tell you if I own one of these. It's the it's the tickers that sometimes throw me off. Um, Yes, I own VSMAX. I'm glad I looked that up because I always do like to disclose when we're talking about an investment. I like to tell you whether I own it or not. Um, I don't know, just because I think you should know. Um, but in any event, uh, let's look at VSMAX. I don't think is a, it, 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 I, if I were getting a, a small cap fund today, I probably wouldn't do VSMAX. It was part of a, of, um, a tax loss harvesting thing that I moved out of one into this one. I'll show you why I probably wouldn't pick this one, at least if it hasn't changed since I last looked at it. Yeah, it's a small cap, but it's squarely in the blend zone, and it's it's a it's a it's a large small cap fund. Um, so if you look at the average market cap on this fund, it's five billion for the company. Now let's look at this other one. Remember, five billion. I just don't remember. This is tax managed. This might not be my choice either. Um, not that there's anything wrong with tax managed, but let's see here. Okay, so th this might be better. It's extremely small cap, right? And if we go to the member 5 billion, well, this one's only 2 billion. And it's tilted more towards value. I wouldn't mind it even being in the value box. And my thought is, if I'm going to go to the trouble of owning a separate small cap fund, particularly this was true when I was sort of in the accumulation phase and saving, I really wanted small cap value. So I might even look at other funds. Um, I'm perfectly fine with the fund that I have. I, otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it. Um, and my desire to sort of tilt my portfolio that far away from just the whole market 
into a small, extremely small cap. I had micro cap fund at one point, a Bridgeway fund. This is 20 years ago or a long time ago. But today, just where I am, I didn't feel like I needed it. Um, I kind of prefer, though, like, you know, if, if I were still saving and accumulating, probably be in small cap value. So between these two, I would, at the time, years ago, I probably would have picked a VTMSX kind of fund. Um, but I own VSMAX now. And you might say, well, Rob, wait, 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 wait. Which is it? This one or that one? Well, I mean, that's the thing. These are all reasonable choices, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, nice shirt. Thank you. It's an untuck it. I am not a paid sponsor. Did I tell you I had an e-bike company want to give me a free e-bike to to do a video for you guys on the e-bike? Should have taken it like a two thousand dollar e-bike, but it's like I don't know. I don't want the hassle of promoting products like that and having to come up with a video. And maybe that's stupid. Maybe I should do that. Free e-bike would have been nice. Okay. This wasn't directed at me, but Jekum says, baby steps are good for people who need fixed rules, but it is not always the best advice for all situations. I agree completely with that, 100%. And there have been times, just a comment, where I've needed fixed rules, not, not in the case of money, but when I was really having back problems, this goes back to like 2010 and 2011, and I went to a gym here with a trainer I didn't want him giving me options. I wanted him telling me what I needed to do. Now, I mean, you're obviously going to think it through and you're not going to do something crazy, but I needed him to tell me this, you need to do this and then you need to do that. And I needed that. Um, and it, it helped. So yeah, I get that. All right. So this is an interesting question from John. And I've had this kind of question come up recently, not about Paul Merriman, but anyway, here's his question. I have a Fidelity Roth IRA and I am investing in nine ETS. I would like to transition to the Paul Merriman ultimate buy and hold portfolio. How do I transition? Well, um, it's really in a Roth, it's simple, right? Because you're not going to have any tax consequences for, from, from buying and selling in a, in a retirement account. So you identify the funds that you want, and Paul has great resources on this. Let me see if I can just pull it up for you. And I've done a video on his ultimate buy and hold. Let's see what the most recent um, – let me just pull up. He's got different buy and hold, so you need to – let me see if I can just pull one up. I don't know if he gives tickers. Somewhere he's going to give tickers. I just don't know where. This is this is what his sheets look like. But uh, he's not giving tickers here. You could search my videos. I think I probably put tickers in there, but it was a long time ago, so I could be wrong. But in any event, figure out the the funds you want to implement, and it should be easy, you know, um, to find index funds that do it. And then just sell your nine ETFs. You're not going to withdraw the money from the Roth. Keep it in the Roth. goes to cash. And then buy the funds in whatever percentage you know you want. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward. The question I had, and in fact, I, it was an email today, was should they should they make the, it wasn't, again, it wasn't to Paul Merriman's portfolio, but should you make the transition gradually or all at once? Now, we, we get that question a lot in terms of lump sum versus dollar cost averaging. But in that case, you're, you're going from cash to stocks. In this case, assuming I'm going to assume your, your nine ETFs or stocks or most of them, you're just going from stocks to stocks. I mean, the, the, the specific funds might change. And as a result, the, the allocation to different subclasses might change. But at least to me, if I'm switching funds for some reason, but my asset allocation isn't changing. I, I don't even give it a second. Well, I, I do lump sum investing anyway. But, but at least then I do think about it uh, when I'm putting cash in. But um, if I'm just going from one stock fund to another and I'm more or less keeping certainly the stock bond allocation the same, I just do it all at once. Can 
Kevin, this is a great question. Does it make sense to incur the tax penalty and rebalance a long-term investment portfolio from active to passive, or is it better to avoid the potential tax implications and stay invested in, in, in active? I would look at a couple of things. First of all, I would look at what active funds I'm in. If I'm in really, really expensive funds, that's going to tilt in favor of, you know, there'll be other things to consider, but maybe paying the tax. Maybe, but you're maybe in low cost active funds offered by Vanguard, for example, in which case I might not be so quick to change those. Uh, I would also look at what my, the tax implications are actually going to be. And can I, this is where I might do it over time, not because of the, fear of the investing side of things, but I, I may not want to incur all of those taxes in the same year. This depends. Do I have tax losses that I can offset some of the gains? So there's a lot of tax questions that you need to figure out. You can talk to a tax professional if you need that, you need help. Um, but so I'd be looking at that and then just how bad are the funds? You know, I don't, I don't have a, a, a line in the sand. Well, if it's over this expense ratio, I'd absolutely change. But I think generally funds that are around 75 basis points or less for active are on the low side for active. Um, certainly anything above 1%, I would put on the high side. But again, I'd still have, you'd still have to look at the, the tax consequences and, and figure out a plan that may, may stretch, could stretch over a number of years potentially. All right. What else do we have? I think I already answered this question. I was mainly, mainly focused on JEPQ, but my answer would be similar to JEPI. Um, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of those funds, but it, I, I, as I said, it's fun to watch the Reddit people. I mean, they're just having a party over there. That's where, you know, I've kind of poo-pooed dividends a little bit in the past. And, and I, I wonder if that's a mistake only to the extent that people get really excited about their dividends. And I don't want to throw cold water on that. In fact, I'm going to do a video. I've got it in my calendar on how to, on how, just how to track your dividends. And it's not that hard, but there are tools that can help you. And you, they can also estimate what your future dividends will be over the next year. And, you know, if, if that's, I, I like getting a dividend check. Uh, you know, when I see that I get paid a dividend, I understand how dividends operate and that I'm not any wealthier the day I get my dividend check. But it's still fun. And I don't want to, you know, why, why not have some fun with it? All right, dividends are coming in. But yeah, the folks over in the Reddit channel for Jeppy are just, they're having a party. It, it does concern me, though, when I hear, I don't ever post, I'm just, a, I just lurk. I don't, I've never posted in that channel, but it does alarm me when, when, when someone gets on this, okay, I'm retired. And I think I'm just going to put all my money into one of, one of these funds. And I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't know what to say about that. Don't, but I, I don't, you know, I would get shot down if I, if I actually commented in that channel, I think it would, it would, I would get downvoted right off of Reddit. So another question, um, a second question from Jekum. Jekum, I guess I'm pronouncing that right. I th have I talked about the tax torpedo? I think I have. Um, let me just see if I've done a video on the tax torpedo. I think it's up. I guess in one one in one video, zero percent long term capital gains tax is it legit? It was a year ago. You can check that out. I don't remember ex exactly what I said, but yeah, it can be a real issue. So if you are collecting Social Security, you probably need to involve um, a tax preparer to understand the consequences of the conversion because it's not your marginal tax bracket, although that's obviously an important part of it. It's your it's your it's the effective tax rate. And you could be in a, in a marginal tax bracket, but your last dollar could, could be taxed more because it, it, it causes more of your Social Security to get taxed. Um, and so you really, need, you really need a tax pro or 
you know, or, or spend the time to put your taxes through some software and figure it out. It can get complicated. All right. Dave says that the 4% rule, whoops, that's not the right one. Here it is. Dave says the 4% rule is not a rule. That is true. It's more of a guideline. I think there was a movie about that. Anyone know what movie that's from? That's an easy one, right? Johnny Depp, does that give it away? Probably. Ah. Oh no, I'm not out of the basement. This is my basement. Mom of three adults. I haven't been here for a while. I was robbed out of the basement. No, this is the basement. All I did was turn my desk. I can still see the ugly painting that was behind me. All right. Oh, this is such a, an important comment. Eat more coleslaw. That's the name of the person making this comment. Assuming your portfolio yields 4% in dividends, 4% rule can be accomplished without ever selling a share. Um, so here's the problem with that. It seems to make sense, right? I mean, 4% equals 4%, it kind of lines up. So there's, there's two problems with that. Your 4% at the moment gets applied to your portfolio value. What if the portfolio, what if dividends get cut? Because it happens, particularly in bad times. So that's one problem. But you also have to keep up with inflation. And so um, that's why a dividend approach to retirement spending, I think, is problematic. Now, if you said, OK, I'm good, I can live off dividends and I'm invested in sort of a, a broad based index fund portfolio. That's an incredibly safe way to go. But the reason it's so safe is your yield is going to be maybe 2%. If you throw in some international and some bonds, um, you know, stocks are still, what's the, what's, what's the yield on VU? Can't be much. One and a half, let's see. VU is the S&P 500 uh, Vanguard index. 12-month yield, 1.6. So if you could live off of dividends with sort of a broad-based portfolio, it's very, it's a very safe thing to do because the dividend yield is so low, but most, most people can't do that. So then what you start doing is, well, I'm going to reach for yield by investing in things that pay a higher dividend. So maybe I go to value. What's, uh, what's SCHD paying now? See, it's not 4%, 3.64. Close, but it, you know, not three, not 4%. And so maybe you get you th throw in some REITs um, or other things, and you just have to be careful because, again, dividends can get cut, and you've got to keep up with inflation. Now, it may work out for you, but you just got to sort of think through those issues, in my view, before you make that decision. Um, Ethan says that the Rational Reminder podcast has, a, has an excellent uh, show on covered calls, so check that out. I mean, the rational, I don't listen to podcasts a lot. I listen to Rational Reminder podcasts from time to time, but they, you know, it's an excellent podcast and YouTube channel. Um, all right. So Kelly says, any thoughts on investments appropriate in a five-year inherited IRA? Well, hoping to, to fire financial independence for early in four years. The, the question, I, I understand, I don't know what your the specific rules are that apply to your inherited IRA, but you, you may be forced to um, sell. Maybe you've had it for five years and you're under the 10-year rule, but whatever. That's just going to trigger taxes, right? This doesn't mean you have to spend the money. You could get it out of the inherited IRA and put it in a taxable account. So the first thing I would figure out is, how long am I really going to be investing for? Um, you know, if you plan to spend it in five years, then I, for me, I would be very conservative. I might have some allocation to stocks. But the other thing I would do now that I think about it is I would base the asset allocation over across all of my accounts, not just this one. So, so really, now that I think about it, um, I would probably invest this like I would a, tra a traditional, I assume it's traditional 
um, uh, IRA, which is one place where I would put my fixed income. Um, even if you weren't planning to spend it, you might get it out of there if you're required to pay the taxes and put it into a taxable account. Um, at that point, because you've had to effectively liquidate, you're getting you're getting it out of the account. You could then put it in a taxable account in something else. But there are a lot of things I'd think through there. I probably would make the decision based on my portfolio as a whole, which could include any number of accounts. If it's a if it's a traditional IRA, I guess it has to be right. Um, I don't know. And the rules on Roths, do you have to pull them out in so many years? I know there was talk about requiring that. I don't know if they did that or not. I've never owned an inherited Roth IRA. Someone in, someone listening knows the answer to that, but let's assume it's traditional. Um, yeah, I would probably plan it based on all of my accounts, do a plan across all of them. If, assuming this is traditional, I would put in it whatever I want in traditional accounts for me. It's some stocks, but it's also fixed income. Um, and then when I pulled it out, it depends what I'm going to do with it. I mean, you know, again, you could you could spend it or maybe you don't need to spend all of it and you it could just go into a taxable account. I think that's, I'm sure I'm missing something, but that's how I, I think I would think through it. These are tricky questions. I need an easy question. Oh, look at this. Eat more coleslaw works for Dave. Okay, now it's become unclear. I don't, I don't know what that means. I own dividend paying ETS. Well, so do I. I don't own VYM, but I own SCHD. Although I, I call that a value fund. I know the word dividend is in the name of the fund. Okay. So Ed wants to know the impact if we lose, uh, if the dollar loses its reserve status. Well, it certainly could make borrowing more expensive, right? I would think. Um, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world. You know, there, there, people live all over this world in really nice environments without their currency being the reserve status, you know, the reserve currency of the world. <laughs> yeah. And, and eventually, I presume someday will come when we're not the reserve currency, of the, right? I mean, nothing lasts forever. Um, but I would think, you know, a lot of things are obviously bought and sold in. U.S. dollars, and that benefits us. And there's a huge demand for our treasuries. Um, so there would be some significant consequences. I can't pretend to be a international economist that can figure out, you know, all of the things that would happen. But it seems to me one thing I, I, I got to believe our cost for, of our government to borrow. Of course, that could it has gone has gone up, and who knows? Maybe it continues to go up. And that, that's a big big problem. Um, long-term for us because obviously debt's going up. There doesn't seem to be willpower in Congress uh, or the White House to deal with it. I, you know, um, one side wants to cut spending and cut taxes. Um, the other side wants to increase taxes and maybe, and maybe, I don't know, which could help with the debt, right? But, or the deficit, but maybe increase spending. And, on the, while we might want to blame Washington, we're the ones that send them all to Washington. We're the ones that give them their jobs. If you think about it, imagine a president, someone's running for president uh, here in the next election, and they said, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, we're really going to tackle this deficit problem. So we're going to do two things. We're going to raise taxes, by the way, and including the middle class, because we may, we may tax the wealthy, but that's not going to solve our problem. We'll hit them hard, but we're going to have to hit the middle class and we're going to cut spending. <laughs> no one would vote for them. The Republicans wouldn't vote for them. The Democrats wouldn't vote for them. So anyway, yeah, it's a problem. And um, and uh, as our debt goes up, any increases in the interest, uh, you know, causes bigger, bigger problems. And when you look at projections, it's ugly. I don't have a solution. Someone, I did. I can't show it. I don't know why. Sometimes messages go up and I can't get back to them. But but someone asked just a second ago, if the fact that the S and P five hundred is top heavy, meaning the largest companies make up a big proportion, 
We can look at it. We were looking at VU, right? Let's go back to VU for a second. The short answer is no, it doesn't bother me at all. It's how it's always been. I mean, there at times the top 10 represent more of the S&P 500 than others, but that's how it's always been. Um, so if we look at the portfolio, we can see like Apple is 7%. Just Apple and Microsoft alone, 13, almost 14%. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So we're over 25% with the top 10. And that'll change. And these 10 will change. If we went back 20 years, it was totally different companies for the most part. It, it just doesn't concern me. It's a market cap weighted index, which I think is how it should be. Because we're basically trying to mimic the market. Let's see here. Is the show on every other Monday? Well, this is an easy question. The answer is yes. Um, kind of got busy this year um, with some uh, some family obligations and whatnot. And uh, so I, I went to every other Monday. That might change at some point. But for now, that's that's what we're doing. And, and I should mention, two weeks from today is, is Memorial Day, I think. So it won't be that Monday. It'll be the following Tuesday. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be May thirtieth is when I'll well I'll have the next show. If you subscribe to the newsletter, it goes out every Sunday morning, and I put in there a reminder. All right, looking for a good question. They're all good, just maybe one that I can answer. Do try to tag me because I'm trying to. Oh, Jeff was in German Village. Lovely place. I was there not too long ago. And at the book loft, bought a book, as a matter of fact. I forget which one. And it's not important. All right, here we go from Paul. Can you tell me how you, or us, how you educated yourself on nutrition and exercise? So on the, uh, well, this is true for both. So I started, so I had terrible back issues that stemmed from injuries in college, playing intramural sports and whatnot. And, but it got worse as I aged. Oh, see, I'm stretching now. Um, and by 2010, and I was, how old was I? 40-ish. Uh, my back would go out on me and it was really hard to walk for about a week. And that, and then it was another month before I felt what I would call normal. Um, and this was happening more and more. And I'm thinking, well, I'm 40. What happens when I'm 70? I mean, at 40, I could move because I had the, uh, the, the arm strength to get around, but it was ugly. So I, I'd been to, I've done everything, you know, chiropractor, um, they do needling, uh, electric stem, sound, heat, um, cupping, you know, uh, um, so and nothing was really helping. And my, here's what happened. My, my physical therapist who was doing the dry needling right into the muscle, boom. Um, he got into a car accident and hurt his back. And I was, I was at his office and I'm, and um, you know, he was um, still able to work, but I, I said to him, so what does a physical therapist do when you get hurt? And he goes, well, I'm going to this gym and it's, it, I'll say it's kind of like CrossFit. Although if the owner heard that he would be very upset with me. Um, but you, you get your own individualized program. It's, you know, it's weightlifting, but you know, there's other things, a lot of planking, a lot of core. And so I went to him and he started from the ground up and my exercises were laying on the floor, rolling over from my back to my stomach without using my arms or legs, just engaging the core, but that's how bad I was. And it was planks and, you know, resistance bands where you're doing, pay, I think, payoff. I think I'm pronouncing it right, payoff press. You got a resistance band attached to something, you stretch it out, and it's trying to pull you back. So you engage your core so that it can't pull you back. And then you slowly pull it out. And of course, when you do this, it's now pulling from here. 
And so you've really got to, my back just popped when I did that, by the way, you got to really engage the core. And, and so all of the, you know, kettlebell carries, you know, where I do a suitcase carry one arm kettlebell carry or do it in the rack position or um, not a lot of sit-ups by the way, but I was there for 10, 10 years, 11 years. And he taught me a, a ton about exercise and it, 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 he has other trainers, not just the owner, but um, it's called underground athlete, by the way, you can Google it. I mean, if you're in Fairfax, Virginia, I highly recommend it. Underground athlete. Let's see. Semi-private personal training. There it is. I know most of these people. Um, let's see if they got a picture of the owner. Anyway, he's a former Marine. And, uh, and But he also taught me a lot about nutrition because that was part of it. But the nutrition part's easy. If you want to eat healthy, you can follow one rule. Don't eat processed food. Boom, done. You might throw in fried food, but if you know if you just rule out processed food, you're eating a pretty good healthy diet. Um, of course, you're not eating refined sugar. You're not eating bread. You're not eating rice. You know, you're not eating Cracker Jacks. <laughs> you know, you're eating fruits and vegetables and proteins, and I eat quinoa. And so the nutrition side of it was actually not that difficult. The difficult part is breaking the bad habits. Um, and now I'm doing yoga. I did yoga today, Bikram hot yoga. All right. Jeff wants to know the series. I, well, the one I mentioned today was silo, which is based on the book. Here's silo. And it's based on the book called wool, which I, it's a series, which I never, um, I read the first, as I mentioned, I think I read the first one by Hugh How Howie, I think is how you pronounce his name. Here it is. So this goes back to 2013. I read the first one when it first came out. I think there were several, as I recall. Um, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's sort of a dystopian kind of thing. I don't know how it ends, though, because I, like I said, I only read the first the first book. Uh, Dave mentions The Diplomat, and I, I loved that. I finished watching it. Talk about a cliffhanger at the end. And I don't think they've officially decided there will be a season two, unless at least they hadn't as of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Night Agent series. Yes, excellent. I watched that too. I don't know this one. I'll have to check that one out. All right. So Kay has a question. Uh, I'm new. Welcome. Is it best to rearrange the 401k to be more bonds and indexes versus stocks? Um, currently have 60% stocks and with everything happening, don't know if that's the best choice. Well, there's a lot of questions, sort of a lot of issues within that question to think about. The first is, so you're 60% stocks, which I guess could be index funds, right? Because they have stock index funds or maybe there's something else. But you're 60% stocks, 40% bonds. So the first question is, is that allocation right for you? Now, I can't, of course, I can't answer that. Part of that's going to depend on your age when you're retiring. Um, uh, your other, you know, do you have a lot of debt or no debt? Do you have other sources of income that, you, that, that you'll have in retirement? Six, you know, as a general rule, 60-40, I think, would be a reasonable portfolio, one of many. And again, depending on a lot of other circumstances, but one reasonable portfolio in retirement. If you're in your 30s or 40s, personally, I had I, I had a much heavier stock allocation, usually 90-10, could be 80-20. Some people have 100% stocks. That was too rich for me. Um, but part of that also depends on what you're comfortable with, because you know it's no good to have a certain allocation. And then when the market goes down, you get afraid and you pull out of it and then you're back in and you're out again. I think you you know that's going to end up being worse off. Um, I think if you have multiple account types, taxable, Roth, and traditional, I generally like fixed income to be in traditional. It doesn't grow as much, but that's the point. Um, you have it for safety and for some degree of security. Although we should all just 
ignore last year. Uh, but that but that's okay. I mean, it's going to be subject to RMDs eventually, required minimum distributions, and I'd, so I'd rather have a smaller balance. Now, I, I you know when I say that, people say, well, wait a minute, that's stupid, Rob. You want a large balance, and if you have to pay taxes, that's okay. And so I want, yeah, yes, you want all your accounts to grow as much as possible, but assuming you're going to have bonds in your portfolio, we know, we're sort of accepting the fact that their expected return isn't as high long term. And I'd rather have those in traditional retirement accounts. There could be exceptions to that, different situations where maybe that's not the way to go. But I can't think of what those would be right now. All right. Oh, well, this is good to know. Peter says that Fidelity's version of life strategy equivalents are called asset manager. Is it asset manager? Is that right? Fidelity asset manager. Okay. Let's see. Tar yeah, target allocation. Yeah, it's a form of target allocation, right? So here they are. Oh, I've, yeah, I've seen these. Yeah, I... I I'd forgotten that's what they're called, but you can see the percentages refer to equities. Now, aren't these more expensive? Or am I making that up? Yeah, I remember considering these now that I look at it and I shied away from them because this one's 69 basis points and that was just more than I wanted to pay. It's got a fairly high turnover rate uh, I shouldn't say that. Twenty set. Well, it's high compared to an index fund, uh, but but of course that's not really an uh, and not really an issue. The turnover rate is relevant. So the turnover is you know what percentage of the assets get bought and sold every year. That's relevant for two reasons. One is it can trigger taxes in a taxable account because they're buying and selling depending on how well they manage their gains and losses. Uh, it can also inc increase transaction costs because there's a fee for all this buying and selling. 27% isn't crazy. I mean, you'll see funds that are much higher than that. And bond funds tend to be higher um, just by the nature of the investments. Um, but yeah, but that's something to consider, I guess. All right. Uh I know I miss questions and I'm sorry. I mean, I never, I mean, I'm still like at 745. So actually not too bad. I'm always well behind though. I'm this is an interesting question from Noreen. I like the untucked shirts. Do they make women's shirts? I think they do, don't they? Untuck it for women. Yes. Untuck it for her, they call it. Although, when I click it, it says no products found in this collection. Oh, maybe it's a sale. Let's go to women. Oh, there you go. Shirts. There it is. See, I should be a paid spokesperson. Vinyl wants to know if I've pitched to untuck it. No, I haven't. But, you know, like, I don't know what I'd get. Like, I, I, maybe free shirts. Rob Harris points out in reference to my $2,000 e-bike that it doesn't buy much these days. That is, some of them get crazy expensive. Patrick says this is undoubtedly an untuck it demographic. Why do I feel like, is that a slight? I'm not sure. Ratty says the shirt looks too tight. Really? This looks too tight. I don't know. I think it's a little. I need. I need to go for a a, a, a fit. Maybe. I is it really too tight? I don't know. All right. So you know something I've not watched at all are the NBA playoffs. I, I heard that the Lakers. Beat the Warriors in six, I think. I'll probably watch the finals. Uh, 
Let's see. Andrew points out that Paul, and I should know this, but Paul has a best-in-class ETF page. I do remember that. Paul Merriman, and he calls it best-in-class, right? You put it in quotes, yeah. Best-in-class best ETF. Oh, here it is. Perfect. So, yeah, if you just Google best-in-class ETF recommendations, and this may be useful for you, even if you're not going to necessarily fo follow one of Paul's um, portfolios. Now, he does mention, uh, well, these, I guess, are public. The DFA, I get DFA, Dimensional Fund Advisors, ETFs, I think, are available to anyone. All right, they're, right, they're publicly traded, so that shouldn't, I don't think you need an advisor for that. But, um, yeah, there you go. Great. Thank you. This is a tough one. I don't have an easy answer, but I'll show you the question from RJ. I'm 60 and have a large concentration of Microsoft, 35% or more. Um, through years of, I guess, so I guess he, he or she worked at Microsoft. Um, employee stock purchase plan and restricted, restrict, restricted stock units. I've never owned an RSU. Restricted stock unit, yeah. Currently in a high tax bracket. Any guidance? Well, I'm, I'm in a somewhat similar situation with Apple, but not nearly that much. And I'm not selling it. Um, I'm not buying more. Uh, but my first question to you, I think, would be in terms of things to think about is if Microsoft stock were to take a hit, I'm sure that wouldn't be, be a happy day for you. But just... To, how to what extent are you jeopardizing your retirement with that exposure? Because the answer might be honestly none. Yeah, I wouldn't be happy to lose, you know, whatever, 50% of my Microsoft holding if it really ran into trouble. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't be on the street. I'd still have my retirement and it, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't significantly change my 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 standard of living. And my my kids might be unhappy someday, but you know, or, or no, it, it would totally wreck me. I, I probably have to go back to work. Th that's kind of the first thing I'd be thinking about. If things go bad, how bad will it be for me? Um, and I would probably let that drive a lot of my decision. Now, having said that, even if you decided you should sell, there's still the question of when, and you stretch it out over years. Are you know, are you going to, do you plan on charitable contributions? If you are, this is what we do with Apple. I'd be making those out of, out of uh, appreciated stock. That's another option. Uh, maybe you're going to make qualified charitable distributions out of your IRAs uh, um, when you when you when you get to the age that you can and you're hitting RMDs. Um, although now that I think about it, this Microsoft stock is not in it's not in a retirement account, probably. So <laughs> forget I said that. Um, but in any event, you could obviously you can contribute to charity from a taxable account, um, which is what we do. Um, so those would be things I would be considering. If if I owned 35%, let's say, of Apple and a, a, a 20 or 30 or 40% decline, and by the way, Kathy Wood, here she came out. She's very concerned about Apple. She's thinking that artificial intelligence and chat GPT could sink Apple, maybe. She didn't use the word sink, so maybe I'm um, uh, exaggerating a bit. But it, what it could hit is their App Store revenue. I, I, it's interesting. It's an interesting idea. I don't, I don't, I don't know if that she gave specific examples. In any event, <laughs> if 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 a big downturn in a position would really affect my retirement, I'd probably be working on transitioning out of it at some level, always factoring in taxes. Um, the, the point of that is, to me, the ultimate question are, is, will I meet my, 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 my life goals, my financial life goals? Not, will I maximize my return? That might be important too, but of course, you never know ahead of time if what you're going to do is going to maximize your return. So if I can meet my goals, that's priority number one. And that I would let that drive my decision if I were in your situation. Yeah, I think that sounds right. 
It's 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 late though. I'm, I'm getting tired, so maybe maybe uh, maybe when I play that back, it won't make any sense to me. So JD wants to know how many individual stocks should I have in my Roth? None. Three. I I don't know. I I. I I'm not. I, I'm. I'm trying to understand the question. I guess the first question is, how many individual stocks should you own at all? Um. But I don't know how to answer that question. I don't have any in my Roths. I own five individual stocks: Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Berkshire, Deer, and Apple. I think that's. Yeah, I think I own five. It's probably five too many, but they've worked out for the most part. Um, Clarice wants to know if planning to retire in three to six years at age 67 uh, to 70, what do you think of investing 10% in AVUV? So I like AVUV and I'll show it to everybody here. Where's my morning star tab? Here it is. It's a small cap value fund. So we're once again talking about value. I did a review of Avant Avantis. Avantis. I don't. I don't own this. If you look at it, um, if I remember correctly, yeah, it's super value, super well, not super value, but it's value, and it's small cap. So I like this fund. And and when I invested in sm small cap value like this, ten percent was my limit. I would put up to 10% of my portfolio in it, but not more. That's just was what I was willing to do. I think, so I don't, I, I think it, in my opinion, a retiree could have a reasonable portfolio that included 10% in small cap value. But the bigger question would be, what's the rest of your portfolio look like? Um, that's the bigger. And then, and then, of course, that question depends on what the rest of your finances look like. Do you have a pension? Do you have annuities? What's your social security strategy? Um, do you have any debt? Do you have, do you have a house that you could you, that you, that's paid off and you could downsize at some point in the future if you had to, or perhaps maybe, maybe go with a reverse mortgage? In other words, all of those questions that I'm asking, a lot of them sort of try to get at how much flexibility do you have to deal with the unexpected? JC says dividends for the win. All right. See, people love me. They love Jeppy. They love their dividends. Maybe I should talk more about dividends, get people fired up about investing. All right. It's almost the end of the show. I'm like scanning now for non-finance-related non, -relate, non -finance related questions. I'm going to go to the bottom. What's happening down here? Yeah. Ah, here's a good question from Steve. Will, I will be posting more podcasts to Apple. Uh, generally, and I know we haven't posted any in a while. I'm actually going to post this. I'm going I'm to start posting every live show for sure. Um, th there's sort of a technical reason uh, that I just need to deal with, but I, I'm guessing. Yes, I think I'll have an interest. Well, it's interesting to me. You guys might not might not care, but I will have an announcement. I'm pretty sure at the next show that will, in some ways, affect the whole podcast question. Um, and even what I'm doing on YouTube. Yeah. It's a big announcement for me. I don't know that you guys will really care. We'll see. All right. Their app store revenue is pretty significant, but everything they do is for the most part, pretty significant. I don't know off the top of my head what their app store revenue is, but, and I also have to assume the margins are ridiculous. I don't think they actually break out margins for just the app store. I don't think. So um, Paul wants to know the difference between a cash management bill and a T-bill. I don't know what, a, I've never heard of a cash management bill. So a T-bill is just a U.S. government bond that matures in, in under a year. Right, that's a T-bill. And then notes are up to, I think, 10 years and bonds are more than, but they're all treasury bills, right? I don't know what a cash management, cash management 
bill. I'm sure it's a thing. Here it is, Treasury Direct. I, this is new to me. I don't know what a cash management bill is. Treasury issues short-term cash management bills periodically to manage short-term financing needs. Huh. They're not auctioned according to a schedule. Maturities run from a few days to one year. Exempt from state and local taxes. They sound a lot like T-bills. I'll have to dig into that one. That's new to me. I've never heard of them before. By the way, it's only been recently that I've invested in T-bills. I mean, before it was just, you know, everything in a bond fund. But I ended up going with T-bills uh, for a lot of my cash just because it's the rates were good and the tax treatment, no state and federal, no state and local income tax. All right. Well, it's 8.30, so I'm going to bring the show to an end. Just checking out the last comments. I wish I could get to everything. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, but I do appreciate that you guys joined the show. It's a lot of fun for me. Hopefully, it's, I don't know, at least somewhat interesting for you all. Um, and uh, But I do appreciate your support. It's you know, it's a lot of fun. And like I said, I will have like a kind of an important announcement, sort of, for me. Um, and it will relate to the show. Uh, I think I'll be able to tell you about it uh, two weeks from tomorrow, because it'll be on a Tuesday. Uh, so have a great week. Have a great Memorial Day. Hope you have a lot of fun, hopefully with family and friends. Um, uh, we're we're going to have a big get together. So looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, there you go. Have a great night. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.